subject certainly found, found, uh, sounds fascinating. So without further ado, I hand you over to Dr. Angela Burr. Thanks to his 
himself, how else am I going to fill the time? And because of the Napoleonic Wars and everything else, he decides to travel in Ireland. And this is the first, the tour I'll describe today, is the first of at least four tours that we know that John Lee made in his lifetime. So shortly after he finishes his Irish tour, he spends two years in Scandinavia, and he's hanging out with all of the great scientists in the University of Uppsala in Sweden, which was so well regarded at the time. Not long after he finishes that tour, he heads off to the Mediterranean and the Eastern Mediterranean, where he spends five years essentially plundering antiquities, Greco-Roman antiquities, that would later form the basis for the private museum he established at his house that is very well respected from the 1830s onwards. And he also returns to Ireland 50 years after his first visit. Because he lives to be quite old, this guy. He returns to Ireland for two weeks, just two short weeks, in September 1857. And what prompted this visit was the British Association for the Advancement of Science were having their annual meeting in Dublin. It used to move around and used to come to Dublin and Belfast regularly, as well as British cities. So he and a young astronomer with whom he was friends decided let's travel to Dublin go to the British Association for the Advancement of Science. They went along to the conference for a couple of days, they associated with their scientific friends, they heard some scientific papers, and then they travelled to Sligo to visit the observatory at Markby Castle. They spent a day or two there, and then they travelled south to see the Burr Leviathan, um, which was built at Burr Castle not too long before. Unfortunately for Lee, he was really into astronomy, but the skies were too poor for observing, so he got to see the Leviathan, but he didn't We'll zip back to 1815. Uh, his name changes from Theot to Lee in 1815 to fulfil the requirements of the inheritance left by his guardian and uncle, William Lee Anthony. There is no one to continue on the Lee name. And William Lee Anthony says, For my nephew and um, I'm charged to receive this inheritance, he must change his surname and perpetuate the Lee name. So that's why I refer to him as John Lee, and that's the name he was best known as for the rest of his life. Now, the inheritance that his uncle left was sizable. However, the estate came with a lot of encumbrances, so it wasn't enough to sustain him on its own. So he decided to continue his studies in law, and he graduated with his law degree in 1816, and became an ecclesiastical lawyer in London, and this helped him to kind of sort out all his but major change came 12 years later, 1827. This is when he inherits the house that his mother grew up in, Hartwell House, near Aylesbury, in Buckinghamshire. Uh, it's stunning. The photograph doesn't do it justice. Um, I didn't get to stay there. It's now a very expensive five-star hotel. Um, but the manager did show me around and let me inside the door just uh, for an hour or so all day. It's a really, really beautiful he inherited the house in 1827. It had been the seat of his mother's family for over 200 years at that point. And this inheritance transforms John Lee. He goes from being you know, an ecclesiastical lawyer in London, busily trying to maintain the estates and their encumbrances and manage everything as well as his career as a lawyer. And then all of a sudden he's given this. And this estate is a much better inheritance than the first one. So all of a sudden he's a gentleman considerable means, and now he's able to pursue his real passions, which are uh, Egyptology and antiquarianism, and the sciences, especially astronomy. So he really makes Hartwell House a centre of scientific inquiry. I compare it to the research centres that we have today, where visiting scholars can come, do their research, use the library, use the observatory, use the museum, speak to each other about their research and their interests. Um, so lots of 19th century British and imperial astronomers actually started out their careers in their early days at the private observatory John Lee established at Hartwell House. They started off there using his telescope, um, which was quite a notable one for the time, and um, doing basic <coughs> observations and learning their craft. The museum he had at the house as well was also very well respected. I mentioned earlier that he had been publishing antiquities for five years, from uh, 1810 to 15 in the Eastern Mediterranean. Well, by 
the 1840s, he had collections of over 4,500 Greco-Roman antiquities at his house, parchments, marble crosses, all sorts of things um, that he had both coached and had been sent to him by contacts in the Middle East and North Africa. So um, in tandem with all this, he was obviously going to be active in a lot of scholarly societies. At the last count, there were over 20 that I know he was involved in. I'm not going to round them all off. Just to give you an idea of the sort of thing he was into, um, actually you can see the observatory on the wing of the house. Just there. And it's engraving. It's not there anymore, unfortunately. It fell into dilapidation and was allowed to, to uh, fall away. But uh, the Brit British Meteorological Society, for example, was founded in the library of Hartwell House in 1850. And Lee was elected president of the Royal Astronomical Society in 1861, and this was a little bit controversial because George Biddle Airy, <coughs> uh, was the other competitor for the role and was much better respected as an astronomer. And as a name that you'll hear if you ever visit the observatory in Greenwich. Um, so Lee picked uh, Airy at the post and it wasn't a popular decision. The other thing that's interesting about Lee as well as the scholarly activities, and I think this has a bearing, it's good to know all this later stuff, because a lot of this has a bearing on what he's interested in when he's in Ireland earlier on in his life. He was really into, um, he was a social reformer essentially, he was an enlightened philanthropist and he was remembered after his death as a model landlord. So he was the driving force behind the foundation of the county infirmary in Aylesbury, the town near his estate, and he assisted the endowment of the Mechanics Institute in Aylesbury as well. And this is where the working man could go and read and attend lectures and learn about engineering and sciences. He also provided new cottages and allotments for his tenants and assisted emigration for any of his tenants who wished to go to South Africa or North America, and there's still correspondence in the archives in Canada between uh, the tenants of his who made good in their new lives in Canada, and they're writing to me, and he's writing back, and he's say, they're saying, you know, how well we're getting on now in our new lives. So they stay in touch with him, which I think shows as well how well regarded he was. The other part of his life that I think is really interesting is that he was active in pacifist and temperance movements uh, from the 1840s. And in 1848, he organized a temperance festival in the extensive grounds of his house in Hartwell. And this ended up becoming an annual event that ran for almost 20 years. This is an illustration of the third festival that occurred in 1851. You can see the house in the background, you can see the people speaking in little groups and the children frolicking. And there's a lovely newspaper description of it as well that describes all the merrymaking while people are standing around drinking glasses. Water. Um, so he was really active in promoting pacifism and temperance. And he actually ran for Parliament three times unsuccessfully, but on those platforms, as well as the anti blood sports platform and extending the franchise to women. So he's actually quite radical in lots of respects when it came to his political views. Despite his later interest in temperance and pacifism, there are um, contradictory, shall we say, pieces of evidence, especially in his Irish diaries from earlier on in his life, uh, that show him almost on a daily basis consuming porter, uh, port wine, uh, cider. Um, he's associating with active servicemen, he's showing a real interest in military affairs, and uh, when he's in Sweden in 1809, he actually goes so far as to write to what was the equivalent of the Swedish Minister for War, saying, you know, I'm really dismayed at the progress of the Napoleonic Wars, and if you have an opening for me, I would love to join your service and assist your country. Now, they turned down his offer, but I think it's a really interesting early glimpse, and it just shows sometimes how biography um, is a lot more complicated than just looking at what a person is best known for. You've got to look at their lives as a whole and what they were interested in when they were young. On to his Irish tour, which is what you've come here really to hear about. It began with his arrival in Dublin on the 30th of August, 1806. He had arrived in a steam packet from Hollyhead, having walked from London to Hollyhead along the banks of the Severn and its picturesque landscapes through the sublime Cambrian Mountains, and then he crosses over to Dublin. He 
head south from there, he goes through the Wicklow Mountains, they were so fashionable and celebrated at the time. He goes through Kilkenny, um, through Waterford and Cork. He even makes it onto the Glasgow Islands, and he's actually the earliest non-Irish person <coughs> who's been able to find who writes a travel plan to the Glasgow Islands in 1806. Um, I'd love to hear about it if anyone looks at an earlier one. He heads back north then to Limerick. And then, for some reason, he stops walking. He's done pretty much everything, or most of it on foot. But when he gets to Limerick, all of a sudden he hops in a post chaise and he kind of zips through the Midlands, back to Dublin, and then briefly heads up to Drogheda for a night or two to visit the site of the Battle of the Boy. His itinerary, as you'll see there, includes the Wicklow Mountains and the Lakes of Killarney. They are two of the three most important tourist sites in Ireland at the time. The third is the Giant's Causeway. He didn't make it to the Giant's Causeway. I think he intended to, though. But his uncle was writing to him saying, what on earth are you doing? This is really bad value for money. I want to know your rationale for extending this tour any further. Do you still intend to go to Scotland? And if so, what's the rationalisation? And I think at that point, he decides to scrap the northern part of the tour and finishes it off in Dublin. Um, the confinement of his itinerary to the southern counties um, I think is not just motivated by possible financial pressure from his uncle, but is also a really common itinerary. Anyone who's looked at Travellers Accounts of Ireland from this period will see that it's very common. They're in the same towns and cities coming up again and again. And this loop around um, from Dublin down through Kilkenny, Waterford, Cork, and then back up through Limerick in the Midlands is quite common. Um, mainly for ease of access, there are well-established staging posts, post sheds, routes, and a lot of the existing travel accounts covered that itinerary as well, so people could be sure of where they were going to go and <coughs> to see with their guidebook in their hand. And then, of course, the two celebrated destinations of Wicklow and Killarney are on that route as well. So, Lee was in Ireland in 1806-7, through up to the of the time, he's in good um, especially in just those two years. Um, he features among a number of notable English literary and antiquarian travellers to Ireland in the years immediately following the Act of Union. So two that I picked out, two of the most notable in those years. Uh, one is the traveller and antiquary Richard Cole Torrin, who's pictured here with this little son in quite a charming picture. In 1806, he made a tour of Ireland. He had already travelled around Western Europe and Britain, so he turns his sight from to the home and he publishes his observations on Ireland in the following year. It's actually quite a decent book still. There's a bit of substance to it. By contrast, there's Sir John Carr, the poor old Sir John Carr. He had already published six travel books of various parts of Europe in quick succession and had earned the nickname The Jaunting Carr uh, for the Kind of unsubstantial nature of his travel accounts. Now, The Stranger in Ireland was published in 1806, the year after he made his tour. And his books sold well, but they haven't really sold the best of time. Um, their lack of quality meant that they kind of fell into obscurity pretty quickly. I already mentioned that the Napoleonic Wars had made the continent less accessible to British travellers, but that's not the only reason that they decided to come. Um, there were other factors contributing to Ireland's growing popularity as a visitor destination. Road transportation had improved in recent decades. The canals were extending westwards, that's also ease of access. There were more guidebooks being published, the likes of Cold War and uh, Sir John Carr. And the quality of the guidebooks improved. People became more discerning um, about the travel of. But Ireland's accession to the Union in 1801 really uh, presented an attraction to English visitors. They were eager to familiarise themselves with what was called the Sister Eye. Um, even if the extent to which Ireland was unknown to English visitors could be a little bit overstated in the contemporary literature. So two years, two decades before the Union, uh, the traveller Thomas Campbell stated, quote, there is perhaps no country dependent on the British crown, which Englishmen know less of than Ireland. And yet, it may safely be affirmed, there is none which has a fairer and stronger claim to their attention. Now, zip forward about 25 years to 1806, and 
Richard IV is still claiming that Ireland, quote, remained unvisited and unknown. Now, at this point, it's worth noting that there were a hundred or so travel accounts of Ireland published in the English language in the second half of the 18th century. So it's worth just sometimes taking these observations into account, but uh, with a little bit of a caveat. For me, personally, on an individual level, the motivation behind his walking tour was described later on as a friend, as a furor for rambling, you know that phrase. And really, his account, when you take it as a whole, the seven months of diary entries, um, they form a charter of the experiences of a solitary romantic so he's travelling mostly on foot, not all the time, but mostly. He's struggling through bogs, he's clambering around the mountains. He's also, uh, by contrast, enjoying the advantages of the easily negotiated towing paths along the river navigations and the, the growing canal network as well. Sometimes if the landscape was too challenging, the weather was too bad, it was getting too late at night and too dark, he would hitch a ride on a tradesman's cart or on a cart of hay. But he always, always made a route to avoid the kind of coach and four style travel that gentlemen travellers generally preferred in the period. So his experience was really personal, really subjective. So when he was down in the lakes of Killarney, this is just him ruminating on his solitude as a pedestrian traveller. He writes in Killarney, a companion here would spoil this for no person could share the time to speak their mind, and the soul is so wrapped up in itself and so full of the sensations which the surrounding objects excite. One friend wrote, indicated in this, uh, later on in this letter, I didn't put the whole thing up, uh, his friend William Longley wrote, him teasing him uh, about his parsimony in choosing to walk everywhere. He thinks it's purely motivated by financial concerns. But Lee, in his diary, um, ruminates on this, and he says that he prefers being in the open air, quote, instead of being parked up in a cage and travelling like a dead body in a hearse. So um, his friend William Longley did tease him a little bit, and I love the poetic quality, the rhyming quality of the opening lines of his letter. He says, how goes on your tour? Do your legs last out? Or has a pony the honour of bearing you about? There's just some gentle ribbing amongst friends there, and really nice. One of the few letters actually that survived. I know Lee was corresponding with family and friends during his tour, but only two of the letters he received still survive, um, because a colleague was supposed to bring a box of his letters back um, to England so he didn't have to carry them around, and the box was lost in a storm at sea. So a terrible shame, we've just got this letter and one letter from his uncle. Uh, giving a hard time about all the money he's spending. And there's a section from the letter from his uncle here on this slide. Um, so this is the only bit of surviving correspondence between Lee and his guardian from the time of his Irish tour. And in this letter, uh, his uncle is exclusively almost writing about money concerns. And he says to his nephew in charge, we've taken almost no notice of this issue. Now, the letter was forwarded, and you can see on the envelope um, where the address has been scored out and written in. So the letter was forwarded. Um, it was addressed to Clonmel, but it missed me. It didn't arrive in time. He'd already moved on to Cork. So it was forwarded. And me just so happened to decide that it was a really good idea. The month of December, it's dark. It's 4.30. Festivities of Christmas are going on. The weather's really terrible. He lodges in Cork four full weeks. Every evening he's hanging around with the musical society people, he's going out fox hunting during the day, he's having a wonderful time and he really enjoys his society there. But the letter from his uncle arrives and kind of puts a stop to his gallop. And I think this might be the reason why a couple of weeks later when Lee reaches Limerick he thinks I'd better get my skates on and he hops in a post shed and zooms through the Midlands in a day or two back to Dublin and ready to go back uh, to England. So I already mentioned that it's a pedestrian tour, it's kind of a model of the romantic solitary pedestrian tour. But what's 
what's interesting is, one of the many things that's interesting, is how his pedestrianism and his interest in antiquities feed into each other. So this is a marginal region of the British Isles, it's the new sister island of the Union. It represents an excessive exoticism to the English traveller. And Glenn Hooper has written a really excellent study, replied study, on um, travel writing about Ireland from the 18th century on. And he highlights Ireland in the eyes of the British traveller as something that can fill an epistemological vacuum. So there's a knowledge gap there and travellers, especially English travellers to Ireland, are trying to fill that gap. So they're looking for political knowledge about Ireland in the wake of 1798 and 1803. And they're concerned about the island's poverty, they're concerned about its economic underdevelopment, and he speaks to all of these things. But the experiences of the British traveller to Ireland in the period after 1898 and 1803 and the Union, um, their experiences are marred by the memory of the violence of many of those events. There's the harsh reality of poverty, there's landlord absenteeism, it certainly doesn't go unnoticed by the travellers. There's political unrest, especially in this region. So the experiences and perceptions of Ireland are being overshadowed by the darkness of its recent history. So throughout his Irish diaries, Lee pays a great deal of attention to the island's recent political history. And he records uh, eyewitness accounts of the events of 1798 and 1803, but especially 98, as related to him by participants and witnesses to those bloody events on both sides. So he has an eyewitness described to him the landing of the French fleet by General Humbert at Kalala in August 98, the hangings and flogging, floggings meted out on both sides, the villages that were raised to the ground. So the raw memory of 98 permeates Lee's account, especially naturally enough, in Leinster and Munster. So it really alters the tone of romantic solitude that's established earlier on in the tour. So on his first day in Dublin, he's straight into it. It's Tales of 98. His host is telling him about servants' treacherous activities. They were stealing his keys and coming and going at all hours of the night. On the second day in Dublin, he visits Thomas Street. I think purposely, because he knows this is where the end of the rebellion kicked off in 1803. He's walking then, a few days <coughs> later, through the Wicklow Mountains in the company of bands of British soldiers, and he's seeing the barracks that were established uh, to deal with the insurgency. As he's going through the mountains, he hears from the soldiers and local residents the stories that are embedded in the place. So he's seeing the remains of abandoned rebel camps from just a few years before they were still visible. He sees the burnt out remains of the great houses. He hears the Rusborough House, for example, was used for quartering for soldiers. In Tipperary, he gets really into it as well. And he spends a few days in the company of Sir Thomas Fitzgerald, Flavie Fitzgerald. He stays at his house for at least one night, possibly up to three nights. His diary is a little sketchy on that detail. And he demonstrates clear admiration for Fitzgerald and his actions as a counter-revolutionary, counter-insurgency figure. Um, despite his own admission in his diaries that Fitzgerald was, quote, a most violent man and therefore dangerous. And I'll say a little bit more about Fitzgerald again later. Please hearing more stories about 98 is travelling around this area. He's in a post chaise from Nine Mile House to Clonmel when he's first coming into the county. Another passenger in the chaise tells Lee um, more rebellion stories, and this time he's telling him about the acrostics um, of the United Irishmen. Now, modern historians doubt their authenticity, but they were well publicised in the newspapers of the time. Um, so that's what's on this slide, and apologies that it's not clear to see. But what that says is Elephus Matus, and the one below says Elias Mantle. And the second one, Elias Mantle, I haven't been able to um, get the decoding for, but the first one is um, when you spell out um, the phrase using each letter in that word, you get every loyal Irish Protestant, I shall murder in this, I swear. And this is supposed to be an oath of the United Irishmen. Um, as I said, a lot of modern historians think it's a fabrication. 
but Lee's recording this, this is what makes it all fascinating, that the activities of the secret society, and he's getting the insight from the eyewitnesses and the participants and the people on the ground. He talks to a lot of poor people as he's walking through the countryside, and he's astonished. Lots of them freely admit to him that they have been rebels. And he asks them, why? Why were you rebels? And they say they were sworn to secrecy by their organization, and they were under threat of physical punishment and violence, having their cabins burnt out, having their children harmed, this sort of thing. So there's a lot of violence going on. There's a lot of violence in the air. It's all around him. He's hearing these stories. So he starts to think a little bit more about his walking habits. He's got a habit of walking a lot at night. He gets into Ireland. It's late August. The nights are still, you know, there's a stretch still in the evening, but it's starting to close in at about 9 o'clock. And as he gets further into the winter and the night falls earlier and earlier, he starts to get a little bit spooked as he's walking around in the evenings by himself in these lonely landscapes. So he starts to fantasize about robberies and attacks and all the stories that he's heard are really getting in on. So there was one night, for example, where he's walking on the commons near Bray. He's not even that far into his tour, just a couple of weeks in Ireland at this stage. A young man approaches him on the road and asks, on the walk, and he records in his diary that he's holding at his belt his geology hammer that he's using to collect geological specimens. He's holding his hand on the handle just in case he needs to use it for self defense. And later on in his diary, he says, You know, I've been a little bit silly. I think this person just wanted some company on the road. But it stays with him that fear. And a few weeks later, he's in Killarney, and again, he gets lost in the mountains dark is falling, he comes to a crossroads and he doesn't know which way to go. All the mountains look the same to him now. And he remembers that fear and he swears in his diary when he gets to the inn safely that night, never again will I walk alone after dark. I remember my mistake. So the violence is really important. And for him, Ireland was all really about history. So he's recording the stories of 1798 and 1803. And he also, as I said earlier, travelled north to Drogheda specifically to visit the site of the Battle of the Boyne. So this is further evidence of Lee's understanding of Ireland as a place that's really inhabited by its own troubled history. So he made sketches of the site. They're pretty rough. It wasn't worth putting them on a slide or a pencil. But he's sketching out the site and he's doing a little bit of battlefield archaeology while he's up at the Boyne. He's trying to find the spot where one army crossed and another army fled. <clears throat> and that night in Drogheda, um, by way of juxtaposition, he enjoys some entertainment by a traditional Irish harpist. And he learns all about the Belfast Harp Festival that had occurred in 1792. So he's enjoying aspects then of traditional Gaelic culture, the remnants of them that survive by allowing himself to be you know, thrilled um, by the danger of walking around Ireland. It is interesting ruins, it will be evident from some of the slides I can put up, like this one. He's really interested in ruins. And why is that? I'm not speaking again to this kind of gothic perspective on Ireland as a place mired in history, a place where you've got physical access to the past, a spooky, haunted place. And it's also, this is around the time, these contemporaneous, we've got to remember, with the likes of Coleridge and Wordsworth. So their lyrical ballads, published in 1798, fetishized the domestic English landscape. They celebrated it in a way it had not been done before, so it becomes really fashionable uh, to look at the landscape in the domestic British and Irish setting with this new appreciation. It's the genre of picturesque travel. It's emphasizing, experiencing ideal forms of nature. Nature should look like a painting. Not the painting should look like nature. And the paintings that nature should resemble are like those of William Gilpin. And he really elucidated the ideal of the picturesque in his own travel books and in his landscape paintings. And that texture is what Lee is emulating his landscape sketches even though they're not well finished and they're not coloured or tinted in. 
Lee's also significantly using an instrument called a clawed glass, and the effect of the clawed glass is on the screen there. So you can see above uh, the Abbey of Ballycrucis in Wales, which Lee visited as part of his trip, and then below it, the same view through a clawed glass. So it gives this ethereal tinge to the view and transforms it, as I said, nature should look like painting, not that painting should look like nature. So the landscape really is moulded to fit this aesthetic and uh, Lee's doing that all the time as he walks around Ireland and admires the ruins he comes across. Holy Cross, for example, I'll mention later, when he visits it, he's trans transfixed by its picturesque quality. So, now on to the third section of the talk, uh, Lee's arrival in Tipperary. He arrived in Dublin, that's the point of entry for most visitors to Ireland. Some arrived into Belfast Port, but most into Dublin. He only stayed in Dublin three nights before he starts heading south. But it takes him 14 days to get as far south as Tipperary, even though he's clocking up at least 20 miles a day. And that's because of his really convoluted route, and because he loves wandering in the mountains. So he arrived in Kilkenny on the 17th of September, 1806, and he travelled from Kilkenny to Clonmel by post chase on the 19th of September, 1806. So the reason I have two different coloured lines there um, is because Lee's itinerary overall was really convoluted and he kept kind of doubling back and looping around on himself. So he ends up visiting Tipperary twice. And the first time is the red line, um, when he comes from Kilkenny and he's traveling south and you know he's going on there to Yaw and down into Cork. And the second time, that's in September 1806, the second time he's spent four weeks in Cork and he's enjoyed everything there. And then he comes back this way through Dungarvan into Waterford. And he leaves Waterford on the 20th of January 1807. So this is four months later. And he travels following the East Barrows up through Clonmel, Cashel. Um, he's seeing a lot of the villages and then the settlements around the Syria and then up to Limerick. <coughs> so he stayed the first time, the Red Line, in September 1806. He stayed in Clonmel for three nights before walking to Yaw via Cap Quinn on the 22nd of September hikes through the Knock and Down Mountains and he really loves that experience. And then he returns to Tipperary on the 20th of January 1807. He rides in Carrickenshire by a post chaise from Waterford. He walks from Carrick to Clonmel on that same day. He stays at Clonmel that night and the following morning he sets out walking for Cashel. He stayed in Cashel on the night of the 21st of January before going on to stay at least one but possibly up to nights at Thomas um, Fitzgerald's house at Lachine. And then he leaves Tipperary on the morning of the 27th of January uh, to go uh, to Limerick. So on his first day in Clonmel, it's still summer, it's the 20th of September, but summer's fading, and it's a Saturday. So he walks around Clonmel, he visits the church, he visits the birthplace of Lawrence Stern, and he goes to see a great butter house where butter is being packed up for export to London. And he also visits what he calls an extensive piggery where uh, he watches the pork being cured and packed for export as well. And he noted on his return to Tipperary four months later that every cabin in the county kept a pig. At least one, many kept two. And this was to help them pay the rent, they sell the pigs to pay their rent. So when he starts thinking about how the poor people pay their rent, he asks the right questions. And he learns about the middlemen. And this is really, I think, interesting in the Tipperary context, that he's getting this kind of socioeconomic information. He notes, the landlord generally lives in England and writes to the agent for remittances. He presses the middlemen, and they in turn press the lower people. Thus the lower suffer, then they go and kill the cattle of the middlemen and commit murders. That's his summary of the agitation that's happening at Tipperary in 1806 
seven. So this is him learning. He hasn't got these names for them. He's learning about the agrarian secret societies that are so active in this region. And the violence, again, violence uh, associated with their activities. So the protest against rising rents and closures upon it for rents. That night, he dines in the company of the soldiers of the barracks. And this is, one wonders, uh, an attempt to ingratiate himself in the right circles, to protect himself possibly, maybe to learn more of all these activities. We can assume after a nice night of uh, celebration and enjoyment and hospitality, he's not writing much in his diary after he comes home except where he has dined. The following day is Sunday, so he attends church in the morning. He hears a service given by a Reverend Douglas in Clonmel. He says he preached without a book and is a very fine orator. He then goes to uh, Colonel John Bagwell's smart beat house. This is where he dines that evening in good company, and jovial spirits, and finds at the house a good library and impressive landscape grounds. On Monday the 22nd, leaves Clamel for Cap Quinn, walking across the mountains. And he was impressed by the grounds of Knock Lofty that he passed on this walk, and this is the grounds of Richard E. Hutchinson, the first era of Dunmore and Keith. So these encounters, when he's in, in Tipperary for the first time, are brief. But when he returns in January 18, 1807, he gets much more meaningful interactions, much more prolonged contact. So his diary records at this point, by the time we get to January 1807, he's made a resolution to record the weather every single day, so it just adds a little dimension and a little bit more insight into his experiences. He records that January the 20th, um, 1807, this was a Tuesday, it was a clear day with a violent wind. So he travels by post chaise from Watford to Cardiff, I'm sure. He says it's through a most fine, rich, flourishing appearance. And he was really impressed with the fine old castle at Carrick, I'm sure. But he didn't linger in the time. Instead, he sets off on foot for Clonmel. He leaves at half past noon. And he walks along the towing path of the Sure Navigation. And he sees all the barges towing there and all the activity. He thought the scenery on that stretch of land was, in his words, the most beautiful I had anywhere seen. And that's a really remark. He's come through Wales, uh, the lakes of Killarney and Wicklow. And he's saying that the sure navigation is the most beautiful he's seen. He also describes this really transports and this is what he really is into. And it's up on the slide there but for those that can't see it. Um, he describes, quote, a great number of fine old ruins and the mountains on the south all covered with the distant mountains were very high and their tops were covered with snow, which had a very fine contrast with the surrounding scenery, which was quite fresh and green. This walk is as fine as any on the black water. He really loved the black water. And as well worth the person's wife walking down the river to carry to sea. I loitered so much and was gazing with such pleasure that it began to grow rather dark by the time I had not got six miles on my way. Therefore, I was obliged to tear myself away from the enchanting scenery. There was ample room for a painter to exert his pencil on this river and the mountains and tower and ruins on it. He just makes you want to be there. The following day, Wednesday the 21st of January, it's a Wednesday, he visits Mr. Watson's bank in Clonmel. He's his uncle, might not like to hear about that. And he sets off on foot. And the weather was severe. There was rain between 10 and 12, then it was windy, and as he says, terribly cold and sharp. But he passed by and admired the houses of sparrows in Oakland and barn house of the Murs, whose names may mean something to some people here. Now he's much anticipated his visit to Cashel. And his first impression is up here on the slide, but again I'll read it out in case it's a little bit small. He says, My curiosity to see the rock of was very great, but my surprise was also great at not getting a sight of it until you come close to the town. This Gibraltar of Ireland, this wonder of nature, is nothing extraordinary. The 
There are many as sudden and rocky mountains of land in that part as that of Cashel. There are two risings or waves of land from Spire which are higher and more commanding than it. The wonder of this place arises from the singularity of their building on that high rocky point more than on any other. The ruins, uh, the ruins of the abbey are the wonder. They are curious and interesting, and there is some fine sculpture, but nothing very extraordinary. On the monumental arch near the cathedral is a base and body of an old statue, which they say is that of St. Patrick. There is as much chance of it being his as anybody else's, it says, if it ever was a likeness of the human being. The round tower is a strong but not handsome building. It's considerably wider at the bottom than at the top. There are a great number of curious old tombstones, etc., and inscriptions in the cathedral, which are all going to ruin from neglect. And the neglect he mentions there, um, there have been extensive repairs to the buildings in the early 18th century. But Lee saw the Rock of Cashel before the extensive repairs that were made in the mid 19th century. So I think as well, that little snippet really says a lot about the problem of expectation being built up in advance of travel and the rapturous descriptions of Cashel that exist in the other travel accounts. It's really built up his expectations when he gets there. He says, yeah, it's fine, but you know, I expect it a little bit more. What he does note in Cashel that I think maybe interests him a little bit more are the dung heaps piled up outside every cabin. And he includes these in his sketches. He finds these dung heaps piled up outside cabins in every town. But he says that in Cashel they're much more numerous. And in another village, he describes what was a disgusting sight to him, but also fascinating. A woman up to her ankles in the dome, piling it up in another um, part of, of the wall of her cabin. And he can't understand the purpose of the exercise. In Cashel, he also dines with military men. He meets a uh, an officer who's recruiting at Cashel. So we're bearing in mind again the wartime context. Now his one favourable impression of Cashel isn't uh, so much the disappointment of the rock of Cashel, it isn't so much the dumb heaps outside every cabin. It's the inn and the unwelcome reception he receives there. I'm sure I'll get a much better reception this evening. Um, he arrives at the inn to be told there are no beds available. They said, we don't have a bed for you, but we'll let you stay for dinner. And he says, okay, I'll stay for dinner. And while he's having dinner, he purposely addresses a letter to Sir Thomas Jefkin Fitzgerald. And in view of all the servants and all the other diners, he sends a small boy to deliver the letter. Surprise, surprise. Later that evening, one of the waiters comes over and says, oh, there was another gentleman supposed to stay, but you can have his room delighted that his plan has worked, he ends up with a most excellent double bedded room all to himself. Now this problem is something that arose again, and it's to do with the fact that Lee is arriving on foot. So the pedestrian traveller is a romantic phenomenon, but it's not necessarily well received at all the inns, and this is something that's been documented in the histories of walking that have come out in the last 20 years or so. So um, when a gentleman arrives on foot, it's assumed He's not arriving in a carriage and four, he hasn't got any money, or he's not a respectable person. The assumption is that he's a vagrant or a troublemaker or some kind of outsider. So Lee has this problem again in Nina. He tries to stay in the best inn in town, which was Cantrell's, and they say, no, we haven't got any room. And uh, the waiter says, well, quite kindly, says, I'll bring you down the street to the other inn. And uh, when they bring him to the other inn, the young woman working there says, well, why can't he stay at your place? And the waiter's been saying, we haven't got any rooms. Um, so there's always this engineering around him trying to get into decent accommodation when he can, even though he's pedestrian and they're not very welcome. Now, uh, we come to January the 22nd, and this is when Lee calls into company with Thomas Jenkins Fitzgerald. He spends the whole day with Flogging Fitzgerald, and it was really exciting and interesting for Lee. He's fascinated by the events of 1798. So he suffers a little bit of hero worship when he's in company with Flogging Fitzgerald. Before he met the man, he heard many exciting stories about his actions during 98, and 
and he wrote in his diary, this is weeks before he even met him, Sir Thomas in this neighbourhood discovered more United Irish in secrets than anybody, flogged a great many and did a great deal by it. He flogged an innkeeper and an apothecary and got a great deal from them. It's a bad way. So despite acknowledging that these methods um, are brutal and, and a bad way, Lee makes no other critical remarks about Fitzgerald after meeting him. So Fitzgerald was then in his 50s, and he had broken his ankle when I exiting coach two weeks before Lee came to visit him. So he was confined to his bed. And Lee's initial impression of him, quote, the most extraordinary man I ever saw. He's of an amazing size and the strongest man in the world. The most gentle and mild-tempered, but most violent on occasions, and most Intrepid. Lee credited Fitzgerald with almost single-handedly having checked the progress of the 98 Rebellion in Tipperary, thereby pre preventing its spread into Cork and further south. And Fitzgerald informed Lee that, quote, he was so active and so dreaded that the rebels offered £700 to anybody who would kill him, and related to Lee many stories of his actions in this area around that time. <clears throat> so Fitzgerald appears in these tales as a fierce and unrelenting counterinsurgency hero. And Lee's diary records many instances where Fitzgerald convinced bands of rebels to give up their arms. Um, on one instance, allegedly a cache of 40,000 pike heads and 30,000 muskets was given up. He got them to divulge their plans, their secret information. Lee writes, uh, the rebels were so cowed as to submit and give up their arms and were glad to depart in peace. And Fitzgerald is pictured haranguing rebel leaders, publicly humiliating them. Lee writes, he would kick the posterior of the rebel captain and take him by the cape and throw him out. You know, it's this uh, really your worship, I think, of this older man. So Lee stays at Fitzgerald's house that night, and it was a most tempestuous and stormy night during which a house in Cashel was alleged to have blown down, as well as the roof tiles from many houses. But he woke up to a day of clear sunshine accompanied by a hard frost. So he spent the day walking around Fitzgerald's very well laid out grounds and enjoyed seeing his farm at Valley Griffin. He was shown around the farm and admired the game on the estate that welcomed rabbits, snipe, partridges. He admired what he called a noble field of Swedish turnips, cultivated especially for fattening Fitzgerald's Kerry bulls. And Lee praised Fitzgerald's husbandry. Fitzgerald could do no wrong for Lee. And Fitzgerald's importation of the best sort of short horned cows from England and the largest sheep possible from Galway to improve his herd. And later the same day, it's such a clear, pleasant day, he rides across to Holy Cross in the company of one Captain Sadler. And Captain Sadler, on the way, points out a bridge at which a rebel had been killed while attempting to escape capture, so he uh, was shot as he attempted to swim away. And close by this bridge was a point of land where a battle had taken place between Fitzgerald and a band of a thousand rebels. The rebels were reported to fled upon the first shot being fired, and when captured, their leader stated that he was unable to rely on his own men to hold their positions, so he chose to flee. At Holy Cross, uh, pictured here, Lee was impressed by what he called the curious ruin, and there he saw the finest piece of black marble I ever saw, an exquisite work, and this was uh, General O'Brien's tomb. At the Abbey, he noted, quote, numerous marks of taste and judgment in architecture unknown to the present day. And he lamented the condition of the site. So as a Cashel, he saw this place going um, literally to ruin. And um, he says, I never saw such fine relics all going to ruin and oblivion so shamefully. In one part of the Abbey, a fine old tomb with pillars of exquisite workmanship has been destroyed to make way for a plain old tomb of 30 years. So Lee had a keen interest in antiquities, that's evident. And later in his life, as I mentioned, he was a renowned antiquarian in possession of a large private museum of Egyptian artifacts. And that's really evident early in his life during his Irish tour. 
Um, so he has a really good appreciation for the richness of the material heritage in the Irish landscape. And he found Tipperary particularly interesting in this regard because of the wealth of rain forts um, and earthen forts in the region. So from the vantage point of Holy Cross Abbey, which is in the centre of the map here, um, he said he could make out many rain forts and ruins. He says, this part of the country swarms with them. It is quite the spot for a painter and antiquarian. And what I did here, just to kind of give a sense um, of what he was seeing, um, Holy Cross is in the middle there. And just using the first edition um, OS map, I've just put a little star where the OS had recorded the rain fort. So um, I think that we probably did see quite a lot um, on his day's ride, whichever direction he may have come from. Again, the following day, he wrote about what he called Danish mounds. He really means ring forts. He rode out to the village of Bolton, and there he um, saw the ruins of the early 13th century priory of St. Edmund at a castle. And en route, he says he passed several Dan Danish mounds of which this country abounds. And his designation of these archaeological remains as Danish wasn't that unusual at the time. The origins and purposes of these remains were debated keenly in the transactions of the Royal Irish Academy and the Royal Society and other publications. Um, so they weren't actually understood as being Gaelic Irish in origin at all. They were understood as Viking remains. Um, now, the rainforts give Lee a chance to learn about Irish folk belief. And he learns about these from Fitzgerald. So Fitzgerald tells you that he had several ring forts on his estate, but that he had levelled one of them a number of years previously as part of a, a, an improvement project on his hands. Now, the local population, Fitzgerald told me, linked his broken ankle that he had sustained two weeks previously to the fact that he had levelled this ring fort. So the local doctor from Cashel, when he was visiting uh, Fitzgerald's house, told me that a local man said, the ankle would be cured if Fitzgerald shoveled up the mound again and the fairies will then be satisfied. And Fitzgerald wasn't the only person who Lee heard about <coughs> supernatural retribution. Uh, the man that Fitzgerald had employed to level the ring fort had a son who was born to untied. So that again was connected to his participation in that. Um, and the local people said this was a punishment from the fairy folk. And Lee's really interested in these stories because they're characteristic, he thinks, of the Irish peasantry and the labouring class. But he was quick to assert that the same doctor who dressed Fitzgerald's leg had performed a corrective surgery on the boy who was born tongue-tied and that the boy was eventually able to speak. And he also, a little bit uh, jocularly, noted, the crime is not so great if you plant fruit trees and flowers for the fairies like that. <coughs> So he was puzzled really by the peasantry and the rural labourers. And he frequently recorded instances of local people who couldn't give him such, as he thought, basic information as the distance to the next town. He used to regularly hire young boys to guide him through the mountains or to carry his heavy bag. He's collecting geological specimens all the time, his bags become really heavy. And he always, always asks them the same question. What age are you? And they can never give the answer. So this is, to Lee, a signal of poverty and illiteracy and a lack of education. But, in contrast, he also meets, because he stops to talk with the people he meets, he learns a lot about them. He meets travelling scholars going from time to time. They're always young girls. <coughs> they're going around begging, but they're carrying their books under their arms. So when he sees boys carrying books, he stops to ask them what they've got there. He finds them carrying maps, texts, theology books. He meets a boy near Callan um, carrying a theology book that was bought for him by his cousin, who was a priest. Um, outside Carlo, he meets a nice civil boy carrying mathematics and theology books. So these little snippets reveal a lot, again, about these people's lives and priorities. The very idea of the travelling scholar going from time to time begging and paying for a few lessons from a master when he can. So um, 
these strike me as important and interesting, and yet another confounding detail about Irish life. He visited Thomas Town and the 2200 acre estate of Lord Landaff. He says its land is reckoned the richest in all Ireland, but the place is completely neglected when Lee finds it. He finds the hedges and livestock all neglected, and he finds that the tenants' cabins are miserable cabins. He says on the whole estate that this is home spot, which a painter would call funny or picturesque. But by contrast, at Dundrum, Lee found that nature had been wonderfully assisted by taste and elegance, by judicious plantations, and by the location of the house against the backdrop of the Galtee Mountains. So he was careful to note, though, that Lord A. Warden of Dundrum was an absentee landlord and that the house had been left boarded up for 10 years. And just on the slide there you see a sketch that Lee made at Ross Gray. It's just a part of a bigger sketch. Um, and what's interesting, um, you may not be able to make it out, but this pencil shadow here is an old castle. And instead of drawing a castle, he's drawn the little cabins and houses with the smoke billowing out from the roofs. Another way that Lee found history embedded in the Irish landscape was in bog finds. And he heard about a lot of those when he was around this area. At Dundrum House, for instance, he was told of a set of elk antlers that had been dug out from the bog. Now, I just mentioned that he said the house had been closed up for 10 years, so it's unclear in his diary whether he somehow gained access to the interior or whether one of the tenants or an agent just told him about these antlers. Either way, he was really interested in this sort of thing, and he reports a series of bog, bog finds from this region. Um, the elk antler, bones from unidentified animals. He likes to think they might be human. Um, and a fine old helmet of great size retrieved from the bog by a local captain. <coughs> the bog is curious in other ways too. And Lee records the story of the Ballybrick and Bog Burst of 1786. And this bog burst was said to cover almost 300 acres of good farmland and to have suffocated the fish in the river Shiver. And a local woman told me that she witnessed the bog burst and that she saw it flow within the shore as far away as Cashel and Carrick on shore. Lee set out early one morning riding through the countryside. The countryside again he notes swarming with rainforests. And while riding, he gives a bit more thought to the landlord absenteeism that he's told is so ubiquitous and temporary. He's struck when he learns that, quote, none of the land possessors live in Tipperary, and that over 10,000 pounds annually was estimated to have been lost to the region economically. He made for Palace, come to Tipperary, and enjoyed the delightful countryside and the gentlemen's residences and the fine estates he finds scattered about, and then went on to Limerick at five that evening. He leaves Tipperary. Not for the very last time. He briefly passes through the north of the county while he's dashing from Limerick to Dublin in a post chaise. He passes through Ross Cray on market day, which for him is wonderful. He loves crowds of people, he loves observing what they're up to. So he describes what he calls the curious sight of pigs in baskets for sale at the market. And he sketches the very fine round tower that he sees in Ross Cray. Now again, he takes care to sketch it in its surroundings. He, just, he doesn't just sketch the tower, he gets in the little residences scattered around the base, and there's the tiniest detail there of the ladder reaching up into the tower. So he's all about that detail and that context. And then he makes this charming sketch. I really like this. I think there's a great sense of humour here. Um, when they're stopped to water the horses in Tomb of Barra. So it's a brief stop. It seems he does some trouble to get down from the sheds, but again, you can see where he's annotated here the poor cabins on the roadside, and you can see the crash roofs, the smoke billowing out from them, and uh, the other, the, the driver and his helper in front of him in the sheds. So, just to finish up, uh, there's another one he's made of the Devil's Bit Mountain in the distance and from uh, the same perspective. Um, so, just to finish up, the ways in which
which we chose to describe and experience Ireland are an important record of the ways in which archaeology and the romantic eye for nature worked together in the late 18th and early 19th century. So for Lee, Ireland was all about history. From the ancient mysteries of the ring fort and the round tower through to the military presence in the wake of 1798 and with the army Napoleon Corps, he relished this vision of an island steeped in history. And the ten days or so that we spent in Tipperary in total reflect his interests in antiquities and in recent history, with his emphasis on rebellion tales and ancient monuments. But what I think is most evocative is the image of the 21 year old Lee sitting by the fire at Machine listening to Thomas Jupkin Fitzgerald's gothic horror story 